Good morning, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, although going from the enthusiastic response, most of you do, my name is uh, Craig schultz Holius, and as part of the ministry team here at Blackwood and on behalf of the whole church, I'd love to welcome you to our service here this morning, whether you're joining us in person or online. We, uh, we hope that you have an experience of uh, God's joy and renewing and peace this morning as we come together in worship, no matter where you've come from or what week you've uh, been through. We know that God is our comfort and our hope. One of my favourite movies is, a, is an English comedy. It's about the police in England. And there's a scene in it in which the neighbourhood watch, you know the neighbourhood watch, that collective of people from your neighbourhood, ordinary people, are uh, sitting around a table, but they're all in dark hoods. And uh, they're chanting what the leader says to them, for the greater good. And they all chant back, the greater good, the greater good. Um, 
when we uh, do these calls and responses, sometimes it can feel a bit like that. It can feel a bit uh, uh, unnatural and a bit weird and almost, uh, you know, for people who are not used to it, cultish. It, it's strange, it's unusual. Um, and uh, we, we're doing that at the moment because we want to give you an opportunity to interact with the service, to have a chance to, because we can't sing, actually uh, be able to say something with your voice, cry out to God in some way. So this morning as we do this, um, don't be like that neighbourhood watch group just uh, chanting the greater good back. But uh, really uh, think about the words and uh, take some time to meditate on them in your hearts. Let them be your prayer, your response to God, your, an overflowing of joy. If you wanted to sing during the song, now's your chance to feel that bubble out. I know I had to cover my mouth during the song. Naomi elbowed me because I started singing along. So uh, let's... let's uh... Thanks, Emma. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep you all your life. It's now time for uh, kids to head out to Kid Zone. Uh, those of you four and up, uh, please uh, follow our leaders out now as we uh, prepare our hearts for the rest of the service by uh, just a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, you are our helper. You are the one who made heaven and earth. And you do not sleep, you do not slumber, but you shade us, you care for us, and you protect us. You keep us from all evil, and you love us for all of our lives. We pray that uh, as we worship you this morning together, we would have that in our hearts and minds, that we would feel your love, your presence, and your cover. Amen. A few years ago, um, I got an email from friends of ours who are now living and working in Saudi Arabia. And uh, they were asking for prayer for this woman who uh, had become a Christian and had been severely persecuted for her faith. And when I first got the email, I thought, oh, I wish I could help. Um, but the, this woman was presently still in her home country. and. Um, in order to do humanitarian visa um, of the particular subclass, you can't actually still be in your home country. You have to have fled. So um, I was praying, I did pray for her and then sort of didn't think anything of it. And then a week later, I got another email from this same couple explaining that, um, well, thanking us for our prayers, but also explaining that this woman and her two children had actually managed to flee to a third country. And straight away I knew, um, and I felt God saying, prompting me to uh, reach out because that now I could actually help. Um, so my background is in immigration law and I am a migration agent and I can do um, all ranges of visas, but um, one of the reasons I really did get into it was so I could do um, a humanitarian um, visas when I had the opportunity and um, so I yeah I reached out to them and said like I can I can help so um, we put together this application um, she definitely met all the legal criteria for um, one of these special um, humanitarian visas but I also knew that it's really hard it's so hard to um, there's only a limited amount of spaces in the Australian humanitarian program and um, I knew that it was still probably a long shot even though she'd managed to flee and she'd managed to um, get to a third country. But we did the application. Um, I was able to get a lot of help from this couple in America, uh, from America um, who helped her in this third country. Um, 
put together the, the right forms and get everything certified and then we submitted it and I asked for especially for priority processing because the country that she would fled from was known to um, to take round up their citizens and send them back forcibly and we also there was a real threat of her family catching up with her um, and she they actually found out where she was and they were trying to take her back um, so it was a real um, sense of urgency with getting this done um, and so I prayed I prayed a lot um, I prayed that God would grant this visa that there would be a spot for her um, and her kids and um, yeah I just remember desperately praying for this woman and then um, after five weeks um, I got a refusal from the embassy and it was <laughs> devastating um, and I did know though it could it could have turned out that way um, but I also had contact with another migration agent who really had a lot of experience with these cases and um, I uh, handballed it onto her essentially and we worked on it together but she um, was able to use some of her contacts within the UNHCR in this country to then get it referred again to the Australian Embassy um, and we thought yeah this time hopefully you'll have more of a chance for the UNHCR referral and um, after a, a few months I think um, it got refused again and uh, even though it was referred by the UN this time and um, again that was another blow <laughs> um, but we we tried again for a third time um, this migration agent <clears throat> had some more cards up her sleeve um, had some more contacts that she tried and um, we after submitting it the third time um, we got an email to say oh um, we know we've we declined the referral from the UN once before, but now now we might look at it again. So it was um, even that was just a, a miracle in itself um, that they backflipped on it. Um, and then it it still took a significant time. It's still probably I think all up the process was still nine months, and um, there was still we had to somehow keep her safe in the city and not be found by people trying to find her and take her back. Um, and um, it but yeah eventually after nine months it got granted and um it was a real answer to prayer for a lot of us a lot of people um and um she um was able to she came to australia and she actually arrived in adelaide so i would have meet her at the airport and um i just felt yeah this um huge thanks to god that he he answered our prayers um in in this woman's life um that saved her so um, it's something that, uh, yeah, even when I did it on my own and tried to do it in my own strength, um, uh, you know, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't always go the way it's, you planned, but I think if you're persistent with prayer and, yeah, you rely on God to bring in that, uh, you know, others to, to work miracles, um, yeah, that can happen. So um, it was a great experience of trusting God, um, and in his timing and in his way of doing things. Before we uh, join together in our family church prayer, um, I had some pastoral news um, for us. Some would um, have just heard. So when Moore passed away yesterday, um, so that is the sister of Edda Thomas and John Shivel. Um, so she passed away peacefully with family. But of course, in these days, um, people can't travel and, and she, so she passed away in Bendigo Hospital. Um, so we're, we're just asking that uh, the church family support, um, certainly Dawn and Edda and the family here who are separate but also the family who are gathered on um, interstate uh, during this time. So you, you would noti have noticed from the video we just saw that we're paying particular attention today to refugees. It's Refugee Sunday. So in bringing prayer to the church family today, um, I'm actually bringing prayers from the National Council of Churches of Australia um, and some reflections on some psalms. Um, to lead, just to lead our thoughts this morning.
Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Lord, no one is a stranger to you, and no one is ever far away from your loving care. In your kindness, watch over refugees and asylum seekers, those separated from their loved ones, those who are lost, and those who have been exiled from their homes. Let us name those we know silently now and those that we may have heard of. Bring them safely to the place where they long to be and help us always to show kindness to strangers and to those in need. God of Abraham, Sarah and Hagar, God of travellers, migrants and refugees, thank you for the beauty and uniqueness of this southern land which we share. Grant your protection and grace to all who shelter here. Forgive the racism and destruction that have been part of our history and our disregard for the pain and oppression within the Australian community today. Help us shed our provision, uh, provincial expectations. Take away our cultural tunnel vision. Open our hearts to be caring neighbours to each other. Direct our lives to just and peaceful action. God of a thousand faces, help us also to acknowledge that you are worshipped in many languages, in different songs and rhythms of life from our own. May we respect these religious insights in each other and assist each faithful expression of you. We rejoice in you, God, in whose image we are brothers and sisters, and by whose example in Jesus Christ we know the breadth and depth of your universal love. May we sit in silence for a time now, allowing the Holy Spirit to touch our minds and hearts with that which we need at this time. And let us close this time of prayer and contemplation with some verses from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, Lord, you know it altogether. O Lord, we rest in your hands. Amen.
Just as we come to a time of communion, we invite those of you at home and those of you here, if you want to get your drink and cracker ready for this time of communion, we encourage you to, to do that now. those precious words around the table we come to Christ the King we gather here at home as I heard 
before the service on a one bar phone in the Flinders Ranges. Who would have believed that COVID would enable us to take Christ to the world? It's good to be able to find something in times of that are sometimes more difficult. And we know we think particularly of those who are really in Victoria and other places we hear around the world of the pain that COVID is bringing. So as Nina asked you, I encourage you to have your ele the elements ready wherever you are in this big wide world of God's creation. Do you remember Jesus' prayer on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Through this prayer, Jesus reveals the deep love and understanding he had for all mankind. And it is he who invites us to join with him around this time. Now, we know Christ died and rose again, resurrected, and has sent us the Holy Spirit. The truth is revealed to us, and in spirit, we can do as he asked us to do, remember him when we meet together, just as he did with his disciples in that upper room. Let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper by joining our voices together in the way our Lord taught us to pray. But you will need to help me, as I always stop halfway through. It goes back 53 years ago. I stood with my dying father, who had, had a, just had a massive heart attack, and he asked me to say with him, the Lord's Prayer. I only got halfway before I was overcome with grief. My dad quietly murmured, It's okay, son. God knows it. He wants us to live it now. With that thought, let us share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> As Maxine said, it's Refugee Sunday, or Refugee Week, we'll make it. And the lovely thought that was brought to us of Eve's story. We reflect on the, flight, the plight of refugees around the world, and especially across our nation. We also recall Jesus was a refugee as a child and again rejected by his own people before he died on the cross. I have chosen to share a recent Henry Nguyen meditation as it draws us into, his, into experiencing his spirit which Christ on, on his resurrection has shared with us the Holy Spirit. It's entitled, Can We Recognize His Presence? The world in which we live today and about whose suffering we know so much seems more than ever a world from which Christ has withdrawn himself. How can I believe that in this world we are constantly constantly being prepared to receive the holy the, to receive the spirit still 
I think that is exactly the message of hope. God has not withdrawn himself. He sent his son to share our human condition. And the son sent us his spirit to lead us into the intimacy of his divine life. It is in the midst of the chaotic suffering of humanity that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love, makes himself visible. But can we recognize his presence? I encourage you now to have communion emblems in front of you and before praying aloud together for this meal, we pause to sense our breathing, shut out our distractions and be open to his presence in spirit. Let us together pray. Almighty God, you know us and what keeps us from you. Restore our relationship with you and each other and send your spirit to make this bread and wine for us the body and blood of Jesus. What you have generously given, we offer back to you. Use it to further your kingdom. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you to preserve you and deliver you to eternal life. Take and eat in remembrance and thanksgiving. Please eat. In the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes the blood of our Lord Jesus given for you, the new covenant and for the forgiveness of sin. Drink together in gratitude and hope. Together we continue in your presence. Amen.
Good morning. Our Bible reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly, who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people. It is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, without soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and my slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favourably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, whether you are here or at home, it is good to have you along. My name is James. I'm one of the uh, ministers here. Uh, as you've uh, heard a few times already, um, it is Refugee Sunday. That's uh, what churches around the world are recognizing. And there's a couple of things we wanted to do uh, to recognize that. One is to celebrate these times where uh, God has been at uh, work in the lives of those fleeing uh, persecution and hunger and difficulty uh, who could not be safe in their own homes. We wanted to celebrate that. We wanted to pray for those for whom this is not a reality yet, who are still facing great difficulty, are still looking for somewhere to call home. We also wanted to have an opportunity, um, a call to action, a call to respond to God and to be a part of something as well. And we have something uh, to do with that uh, this morning. We've had someone get in touch with us who has a very uh, credible um, claim to asylum. He's a political, uh, being persecuted for his politics in his home country, is unable uh, to uh, live there anymore, has fled to a third country, but his situation there is dire also. Uh, it's all it's all very uh, legitimate and a very uh, sad situation as well. There's three things that we invite you to be a part of entirely voluntarily. Number one is to pray for him. Even though he has a valid claim and meets all the legal criteria, the chances of him being offered a humanitarian visa to Australia are still very slim. And so we would invite you to pray for him. He's currently in the Arab, uh, United Arab Emirates. Um, and your prayers would be greatly appreciated. The second thing is, uh, what will help his chances a little bit is to have an Australian proposer. 
someone who is willing to put their name on the paperwork that goes to the government saying, yes, I will pay for this person's flights to come out from the UAE to Australia. I will uh, make contact them with them when they get here and I will uh, support them while they're here. If you are interested in that, come have a conversation with me afterwards. Obviously, that is no small thing and we would want to make sure that you see all the information, that you understand the whole story, that you see all of what that entails to make sure that you are making an informed decision. That's number two, if you might be feeling the call to be a proposer for this man. Number three is to support that proposer with helping the person, if God willing, they are able to make it to Australia to safety, to support uh, this proposer as they support this refugee, uh, also to help them with covering the costs of that uh, flight from the UAE to Australia. Three things that we invite you to do in response uh, to Refugee Sunday, to pray in particular for this man. There's many people out there. This is the person that God has brought before us at the moment. Two, to consider being that proposer. Three, to consider supporting that proposer either with offers of help when the person arrives, hopefully, it is very tough, and also offers to help financially uh, covering the cost of that airfare. For those final two, you'll want to come speak to me uh, after the service in the next coming weeks if you think uh, that might be you. We invite you to consider that. This morning, we continue in the Gospel of Luke. If you are new to Blackwood, um, you uh, won't know that we are on a uh, r- relatively long, relatively slow journey through the Gospel of Luke, broken up with occasional other series that we're doing as a church. And uh, this uh, week we're up to chapter 7. So just before we begin, I invite you to pray. A loving God, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you care for us deeply, that you love us, that you want to transform our hearts and minds. And I pray that you would do that this morning that you would be at work in us, that we would hear your word, we would hear you speaking, that you would break through. Do this, we pray. Amen. There's a sociological or psychological theory that subconsciously we all understand the world as a narrative, as a story. I think there is some weight to this, and if it's true, it's probably also true that at least in our culture, we tend to see ourselves as the main character in this story you know spend five minutes with a four-year-old if you would like any sort of evidence to point in this direction i think subconsciously we tend to see the millions and years of the universe that occurred before we were born as some sort of preamble the story itself really takes place in the decades on which we are on the earth and in this story we understand ourselves as the hero as a person who overcomes adversity or overcomes not knowing much, not having many skills to our name as a child, to go on and achieve great things, to be a good parent, to do great things in business or the business world, to make a difference in the world, to make it a better place, or to minister in the church and achieve things there. And in this story, the people around us are sort of supporting actors, the people around us, and perhaps Jesus himself work as supporting actors who might encourage us and help us out or might make uh, become hurdles for us to overcome might make things difficult for us but this I think is the way that we arrange the world in our minds as this sort of story where we happen to be the main character everything around us it's understandable but it causes a couple of problems firstly if we're the hero of the story it puts a lot of pressure on us If you're the hero, if you're the one driving the world forward, the story forward, if you're the one making it happen, and you fail to achieve what you think you should achieve, if you're a bad parent at times, or if you don't quite do in the workplace what you think you should, or if you don't go ahead and make that difference in the world, if you feel like you're the hero, you'll feel like it's all lost. You'll feel like it's you or nothing. If you don't do it, no one else will. When you see yourself as the main character of this story, it puts an immense pressure on you to achieve and make things happen because subconsciously you think if you don't, no one else will. There's another problem with seeing ourselves as the main character of our stories. It's that it makes suffering even worse. Suffering is bad enough as it is. Chronic pain, the loss of a loved one, the breakdown of a relationship, Life just not going as you want it. It's incredibly 
painful and disorientating. It kind of shakes our souls. They're bad enough in and of themselves, but they're even worse when we see ourselves as the hero of the story. Heroes are meant to be rewarded with health and comfort and security and people around them who love them. And if, if this is happening to us, if our world is falling apart, then in that moment of suffering, it will cause us to question whether the story makes any sense at all or whether it's all just meaningless and the author, God, doesn't know what he's doing. I think this is the trouble we fall into when we see ourselves as the main characters of our story. It puts a lot of pressure on us and it makes our suffering even worse. The centurion in the passage that we just heard from, he was well placed to see himself as the hero of his story, of the story. He was a patron. Now in his culture, the culture that Jesus was a part of as well, there weren't really any banks. And in as much as there were banks, they were really just for the super, super rich. If you were an average person in an average town and you needed something or you wanted to get ahead or you wanted to make something happen, couldn't go to a bank to get a loan, they didn't exist, you had to go to a person, a patron. These patrons would give out what you needed. They would give you money or they would make the connection that you needed, the introduction you needed to get ahead. And in return, you would offer them praise and thanksgiving. You would talk to everyone about how great they were. And this is who this patron, well, it was even more, I should say, as well. In, in, in Rome at the time, if you were a patron, your day would start with all the people you had helped, your clients coming to your house. They would, you would sort out with them what else they needed, and then they'd spend most of the rest of the day following you around as a big retinue, talking about how great you are, which sounds horrible to me, but they really liked it, apparently. This is who this centurion was in this small town, this representative of the greatest empire the world has ever known in some little backwater. This patron who had built the synagogue, who everyone came to, to when they needed help, it would have felt to him like the whole world revolved around him. All these people looking to him to, see how, uh, to show him how important he is and looking to him for help. That's why it's all the more amazing that the centurion didn't see himself as the main character in his story. When his beloved slave falls ill, he calls to Jesus for help. But when he hears that Jesus is coming to his house, he gets concerned and straight away he sends out friends to meet with him, saying, whoa, 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 whoa. sorry, I didn't want you to misunderstand. Uh, you're the Lord, I'm nothing. Please do not concern yourself. Do not bother yourself with coming under my roof. I know who you are. I know that if you merely say the word that my servant, my slave will be healed. So please, if you will, just say the word, but don't bother yourself with coming to me. I'm nobody. Now, it's easy to miss, so I want to point out to you just how remarkable it is what happened there in the centurion. Here is this big, important center of the town, most important guy, big guy on campus. And when he hears the rumors of what Jesus is doing in the area, healing the sick, proclaiming God's kingdom, bringing about wholeness, prophesying on God's behalf, his conclusion looking at Jesus is he is Lord. It is him who is important. It is him who will get things done. He is the main character of this story. I'm just a supporting actor. This isn't about me. And when Jesus hears that this is what the centurion thinks, this is his reaction, he turns to the crowd who follow him and says, not even amongst the faithful, God's people, even amongst Israel, have I seen such great faith. The profound faith of the centurion was in his humility and his perspective. His humility to realize that the world didn't revolve around him. His humility to realize that despite what everyone told him, he actually wasn't the most important person in the room, that it wasn't up to him to get everything done. And it came from his perspective, his ability to see that it was really about Jesus instead. He is the hero of this story. He is the one who will achieve these great things. He is the one who will move the world forward. And this faith for this centurion was a blessing to him. And if we can gain it as well, it will be a blessing to us. When we understand that it is Jesus who is the hero of our stories, 
it takes a bit of the pressure off. When you have that occasional moment where you do something not great as a parent, never ever happened to me, but maybe it will happen to one of you one day, so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd prep you. And all of a sudden, it's not the end of the world because it's not about you. You have responsibility. Jesus will work in you and through you. But he's the hero of this story, not you. When you fail to do that good work in your community or to make a difference in the world like you feel like you should, it's not great. But again, it's not the end of the world. It, who told you it was up to you? that it all rested on your shoulders, that everything would be lost if you didn't pull through. It is Jesus who is Lord, Jesus who is the hero, Jesus who is driving this story forward, and he hasn't stumbled at all. Nothing will stop Jesus achieving his ends. We see it in his life, that he faces the greatest temptation, shame held upon him, physical abuse held upon him, even threatened with death, and nothing, bar nothing, can dissuade him from continuing to do the work that God had given him to do, to bring about healing, to bring about restoration, to bring about hope for those who had lost it. Not even death itself could overcome Jesus. Jesus is the hero of this story and nothing's going to stop him. If we stumble, if we fail at times, the story continues on because nothing will stop Jesus. When we start to understand that Jesus is the main character of our stories, not us, it starts to put suffering in its right perspective. Again, suffering is still brutally difficult and disorientating and horrifying. But we can know that when all feels lost for us, when we don't know what is up or down, when we don't know how to feel happy because of the suffering we're facing, the world keeps moving on. God's purposes keep moving moving on. Jesus keeps moving on. He is compassionate and he will bring things to their good end. When we understand that Jesus is the humane character of the story, we will, we will lament at times, we will be in pain, but we need not fall into despair at the thought that all is lost. 30 seconds for the Lord of the Rings fans in the room. If Denethor could have just realized that Frodo was the main character of the story, not him. He still would have been pained at the loss of his son and how Gondor was being assailed by the armies of Mordor. But he need not have despaired because Frodo continued on to do his good work. Not all was lost. Thank you. you can, everyone else can pay attention again now. The centurion's faith wasn't just good. It just wasn't the right thing to do. It was a blessing for him. It's a bit of a theme we've seen in Luke's gospel recently. I think we have this feeling in our culture, in our world, that to make things better, to make ourselves happier, we need to make things more about us. That maybe the reason why we've missed out is because we didn't focus on ourselves enough. We weren't good enough to ourselves. We didn't put ourselves first enough. So we have this drive to answer our problems and our feeling of discomfort by making ourselves more the main characters of our story and seeing more how these people can support us and help us and have everything revolve around us. It feels like it should work, but it doesn't. It does the opposite. It just puts way too much pressure on us. We were made to recognize that Jesus is the hero of this story, not us. We were made and find our fulfillment and our glorious uh, personalities come to life when we step into this supporting role. It's what we were made for and where we flourish. I strongly believe that this is something God is always calling us into, this change in perspective and this humility. And there's a few ways he's been doing it in my life and I'm sure he's been doing it in your life too. I think he's probably been doing it when he invites you to praise. For example, when you come to church and the song starts and you don't sing along with gusto, when you follow those words and you hear the words of the call to worship, you partake in communion, which is about Jesus, when you allow, follow that invitation that God has given you to allow your thoughts to be directed towards him, to realize it's about him. As you go on in that and allow that to happen, 
your worldview starts to get reshifted and you start to realize that it's not all about you, it's about him. I think our perspective and our faith shifts when we follow God's invitation to respond to him in thankfulness. To look at what we have, our homes, our jobs, our friends and all these things and not to go, how great am I? I built this, I brought this about, I deserve this, I got it. But to recognize the truth and to see that they are good gifts from the hero of the story. They are good gifts from God. They are good gifts from Jesus. Gratitude as we continue in gratitude. Grace set after a meal. I don't think we realize quite how profound that is as it shapes us, it shapes our thinking. The final thing I think God invites us to do to step into this faith, this humility and perspective that the centurion had is to ask where we can serve. When you come to the beginning of the year, New Year's resolutions or the beginning of the month or your week and you're thinking, what am I doing today? How revolutionary would it be for us? How revolutionary would it be for the world if we started with the question, Jesus, what's my role in this story? How can I support? How do I play my role? Not trying to be the hero, but simply following you. Out of all the faithful, all of Israel, no one recognized this truth that the centurion saw. It was a gift from God to him. May it be a gift to us as well. May we take on that humility and that perspective to realize it's not all about us. Let us pray. Our loving God in heaven, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you care about us. We acknowledge now, perhaps intellectually, that is true, that, that this story is about you, it's not about us. And we just ask through things like praise and thankfulness and service that you would reshift our understanding so that we might grow into that, that we might find our proper place, be free of some of that pressure, uh, not thinking that it's all on our shoulders, but to see you and to follow you. Do this work in us by your spirit. May we know your presence. May we know you're transforming. In your name we pray. Well, I'm going to um, break a rule now and give you several points to remember at once. <laughs> they say not to do that. This is the point where... No, that's right, Emma, if you want to go back to that. Um, they, um, uh, this part, the part of the service where we invite you to respond. Something that's happened at some point in the service, at any point, a thought, a feeling, think about it. See if it's God speaking to you, doing something in you. And there's a few ways you can do that. Number one, don't forget those offers, uh, that invitation that I made before the sermon about this young man to pray, to be a proposer, to um, help out that proposer. That's one. Two, we invite you to leave either online a digital welcome card. The link's in the description of the YouTube video. You can just click on that and it'll take you straight there. Or here in the chapel, in your Connect card in front of you, you can just write out prayer requests. Just let us know something that's impacted you. If you want someone to get in touch with you, and you can leave that there, and uh, we will follow it up. Three, 1 p.m. Wednesdays, we're starting a, well, I'm starting a prayer time here in the chapel. We're going to be hearing from God what he's, trying to hear from God what he's saying to the church and praying for the church in response. And finally, I forgot the fourth one. That's embarrassing. Okay, I'll just assume that's it. I'll remember later. We're about to conclude uh, with a uh, blessing and uh, a song for you to listen to. Our uh, chair of elders, Andrew Knight, has some announcements to make after that final song. So if you are part of the church family listening online, you want to hang around for that. And uh, we invite all you here to stay in the chapel as well. So now from uh, the second epistle of John. We have this lovely blessing that I leave with you as we conclude today. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and Jesus Christ the Father, Son, in truth and in love. Amen.
Yeah, we just had a couple of things we wanted to update you guys on um, from the elders, and then I've got a statement to read out just in regards to um, ministry for next year. Um, the first one was, as you all know, our AGM wasn't be able to be held this year, early in the year, because of the uh, restrictions at the time. Um, we decided to run the AGM and the half-yearly meeting both together this year, and that's going to be on the 15th of, the no of November. So if you can uh, keep that date free, it'll be after the service on the... Sunday morning. Um, there's a couple of positions up up uh, then. I myself as elder and Andrew Tidwell as secretary. Uh, we've both accepted nominations to continue, um, so they'll be voting before the the meeting for our positions. Then uh, the the budget for 2021 will also be presented at that meeting. So um, make sure you put it in your diaries and be there. Uh, we also just want to let you know that Steve Mills, who's currently one of the elders. Um, due to, he's, he's had his work um, conditions change and he's under a real uh, virtually double workload at the moment. So he's just felt like he can't really commit to his elders role at the moment um, as, as much as he would like to. So he's decided with the support of the elders just to take the rest of the year off uh, and have a bit of a break and then we'll reassess that at, um, at the end of the year and see how he's, he's feeling and what's happened with his workload then. So Steve's just having a bit of a break from elders at the moment. Um, I'm going to read this statement out because I want to make sure I get it right and get all the information across. Uh, it's been prepared by the elders um, just in regards to our uh, Associate Minister Craig for next year. After much prayerful deliberation, the elders have made the difficult decision that we do not have a significant need of an Associate Minister in 2021. As such, it's with much sadness that we announce we have decided not to extend Craig's contract at the end of his current term this year. Over the last two years, family ministry, small groups, pastoral care and the night service have been areas of responsibility for the associate minister. In that time, we've discovered that each of these are either self-sufficient and largely run themselves, or in the case of the night service, face an uncertain future due, due to COVID-19. When we tried to think of other areas of responsibility to give to an associate minister and did not come up with any, we came to the realisation our strong culture of pastoral care and excellent lay leadership mean that even while we are growing numerically, we do not have a substantial use for an associate minister at this time. At this stage, we have no plans to hire any new staff in lieu of the associate minister role. We're currently considering, currently considering how best to allocate funds for the 2021 budget exploring increasing our contribution to the Churches of Christ State Conference, funding missions and community development, investing in online church, equipping other ministries and other areas. We love Craig and appreciate his work filling in the gaps, creating resources for our worship service, participating in the worship service, supporting the youth group and caring for our members. However, we feel that to extend Craig's contract without having a significant area of responsibility for him, would not be good stewardship of the funds entrusted to us. It would also leave Craig underutilised without opportunities to grow in his vocation. In short, it would neither be good for Craig or the church. Craig's contract finishes on the 7th of January 2021 and he will continue in his usual role two days a week until then. We appreciate your ongoing prayer and support for Craig and Naomi 
while we feel this is the right decision, is not one we wanted to make. I would encourage anyone who's got any questions or feedback um, to talk to myself, James or any of the elders, um, and we look forward to, to catching up with you all if you have any concerns or would just like to discuss things further. So thanks all for your attention and um, that's all for now. <laughs>